Hello, and welcome to I Know Dino, the, the Big, Big Dinosaur, Dinosaur Podcast, Podcast, where we cover news, interviews, and discussions of all things dinosaur. Hello and welcome to I Know Dino. I'm Garrett. And I'm Sabrina. And today's podcast is brought to you by TRX Dinosaurs. They have innovative dinosaur art, including affordable, posable dinosaur sculptures and puppets. And you can find out more by visiting trxdinosaurs.com. This week, our dinosaur of the day is Protoceratops. Surprised we hadn't gotten to that one yet. I don't know what to tell you. (laughs) (laughs) And we have a bunch of dinosaur news. This week, we would like to give an especially big thank you to some of our Stegosaurus patrons, like we always do. And in particular, we would like to thank Scotty, Jackson, Megan Dixon, Eric Keller, Kessler, and Beth and Scott Wilson. Now we're up to exactly 50% of our Stegosaurus patron slots filled. Woohoo! Yeah, pretty exciting. That is exciting. So if you want to be one of the lucky remaining 25, head over to patreon.com slash I know Dino. Claim your spot. (laughs) Or claim a different kind of spot (laughs) at a different level. Jumping right into the news, we have three new dinosaurs to talk about. Whoa. Yeah, pretty crazy. Fell behind a little bit. First up is a new titanosaur from guess where? Argentina. You read it, didn't you? Maybe. (laughs) It's called Chaconosaurus Bailey Willisi, and it was described by Edith Simone and others. And Chaconosaurus is not to be confused with Chocosaurus, which is what it suggests if you Google Chaconosaurus. How do you not confuse it? (laughs) With a chocolate dinosaur. (laughs) So Chaconosaurus comes from the Via El Chocon, in southwest Argentina. It's the name of a place. And Bailey Willisi is named after Bailey Willis, who worked on stratigraphy in the area in the early 20th century. So there you go. It's named after a place and a person. They found a, quote, nearly complete series of dorsal vertebrae, meaning basically the full back of vertebrae, which is pretty amazing for a titanosaur as well as some vertebrae from the neck and tail, and some parts of the limbs. So that's a pretty remarkably complete titanosaur. A lot of times you just see one or two bones, or when they do find enough bones to make up a lot of the dinosaur, it tends to be from several individuals, like we talked about with Patagotitan and Giraffatitan. Combined with the fact that it also has some basal characteristics, They are calling this the most complete basal titanosaur ever discovered. Pretty sweet. Mm -hmm. And it's about 95 million years old, if you're wondering, from the late Cretaceous, as are just about all titanosaurs. Although this is a little bit on the earlier side. Well, it is a basal one. True. The next new dinosaur is a coelophysoid from Argentina. Two from Argentina. Yeah, but coelophysoids are obviously much less common. Those are the small, quick, bipedal dinosaurs, and they're from the Triassic predominantly, a little bit from the early Jurassic. This one's called Powell Venator Podocytus, and it was described by Martin Escura. Powell Venator is named after Jaime Eduardo Powell, who was a paleontologist in Argentina and did some work with titanosaurs, ironically. He's getting a coelophysoid named after him. He's got variety. I guess so. And podocytus is Latin for fast foot. <laughs> That's a good one. <laughs> yep. Powell venator, also known as Powell's hunter, was from the late Triassic about 220 million years ago, so much, much earlier than the other Argentinian dinosaur that was described in the last couple of weeks. The fossils that they describe in the paper were previously assigned to a Silurosaurian, which is kind of a similar type of body plan dinosaur, as well as a Pseudosuchian, which isn't a dinosaur at all. And Pseudosuchians are those like sort of crocodile type bodies with dinosaur limbs 
They always look like crocodiles that are standing, hmm. like with real long legs below them, kind of mm-hmm. like a cross, but maybe even like a dog combined with a crocodile or something. Yeah, weird. Yeah, they look pretty strange. But you could see how the limbs might be misinterpreted from a pseudosuchian to a dinosaur, which is what apparently happened in this case. So now we have a new coelophysoid from Argentina, as well as another new titanosaur, which is very complete. So good couple of weeks for Argentinian paleontology. Mm-hmm. And the last dinosaur I want to talk about is an Uzbekistani elvorosaurid, which is just fun to say. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it was described by Alexander Averyanov and Hans Dieter Seuss, who just got that award at SVP. Mm-hmm. And this one is about 90 million years old, making it the oldest Asian alvarosaurid and the oldest alvarosaurid found in the northern hemisphere. Cool. They're generally from South America, you might remember, and they're those weird ones that kind of have big claws on little tiny arms, <laughs> and they're pretty small bipedal dinosaurs. They kind of seem like, why do they exist? <laughs> you can play as one on Saurian, or you will eventually. Oh, that would be cool. There was one hypothesis that maybe they had these big claws for digging, like as anteaters or something. <laughs> I think of them as kind of like, having little knives for arms and nothing (laughs) else. (laughs) But they were very short, so not like swords, more like little tiny knives. That doesn't seem that helpful. No, unless, I mean, you're doing some digging or all you do is like cut little things or Mm. something. But this one wasn't given a new genus. They just left it as the Bisetki alvarezorid based on the place it was found in. And they found some vertebrae as well as metacarpals, which are the hand bones, at least in humans. They're kind of like wrist bones, sort of, in alvarezorids. And then they have two fingers that they found. And of course, being an alvarezorid, the first finger is enormous, and then the second finger is much smaller. And they believe there was a third finger based on the hand, but they didn't find it. How is that knife-like? So the first finger is just basically an enormous claw Uh, okay and that's pretty much all there is to it's pretty inflexible (laughs) you think the feet acted as forks (laughs) maybe i guess so (laughs) (laughs) and that maybe it didn't even use a fork just knives and then swallow whole i don't Mm. know (laughs) but sometimes you use the fork just to pin down the food while you're using the knife to cut it i don't know if it would be flexible enough to get its knife arm down by its foot be kind of like a yoga move for it because its arms were so short (laughs) (laughs) like touching your chest to your toes that'd be a fun drawing though dinosaur out of as utensils (laughs) i guess so (laughs) (laughs) so this one being fairly young in terms of alvarez swords especially from asia they think that it might help show where alvarez swords evolved from And specifically, they're guessing that maybe they evolved in Asia before migrating over to South America. Although there are some older ones known from South America, so there's still quite a few missing pieces before you can put that together. Now that we're done with new dinosaurs, I'm going to move on to how fast dinosaurs moved, because there are a couple of seemingly conflicting papers on it, which aren't really conflicting at all. But Okay. (laughs) The first I'm going to talk about is by Javier Ruiz, and he published a revision to a paper by Smith et al. And the original paper was about how fast T-Rex ran based on some tracks in Glen Rock, Wyoming. And there were some new trackways, and they estimated based on how far apart the prints were, as well as how big we know T-Rex is, how fast it was probably walking, because you can just do the math. There's a well-known formula for how to calculate that. But what Ruiz says is that the original authors missed a digit in their equation. Mm. The main factors are the length of the stride, which is raised to the 1.67 power. And in the original paper, they had the hip height raised to the negative 1.7 power. But Ruiz says the hip height needs to be raised to the negative 1.17 power. So a much less negative impact by height, in other words. So previously, it's almost like divided by the square of the height, and now it's divided by just a little bit over one of the height. So yeah, makes a pretty big difference on the math. And when Ruiz redid the math, he got that rather than going 
4.5 to 8 kilometers an hour, it went 8.1 to 12.5 kilometers an hour. Or in Imperial units, originally it was 2.8 to 5 miles an hour, and now he's saying more like 5 to 7.8 miles an hour. So they don't even, faster. yeah, and they don't even overlap. So pretty big difference. Interestingly, he says, quote, the results from the Glen Rock Trackway, when properly corrected, are much more supportive of the conclusion of Smith et al., i.e. tyrannosaurs were capable to develop speeds similar to other large carnivorous dinosaurs than the values originally presented in the paper by these authors, end quote, which was their conclusion at the time, that T-Rex was actually faster than previously reported, but then apparently they accidentally made it look slower than they should have based on their analysis and equations. Hmm. So this is still just a speed at a specific moment. So you shouldn't go out thinking, oh, T-Rex only moved between 5 and 7.8 miles an hour because that's just how fast it was probably going when it made these tracks. So that's just one individual and under one set of circumstances, it probably wasn't running based on the track. So it's hard to say what the upper limit was. And then to pile onto that, Holtz has said in the past that tracks preserve in environments that really aren't good for running. They tend to preserve on things like beaches or like mud. Mm. <laughs> and it's not the kind of place you expect to see the fastest movement. Yeah, so, that'll slow you down. Yeah. But 5 to 7.8 miles an hour is decently quick. I mean, a human could very easily outrun that, but it's faster than an average person walks. So. Also, can you outrun that in sand? Yes. Oh. I can. Well. I think most people could. Maybe me for a a short while. Yeah. It's also true. You don't know how long a T-Rex could go this speed. Maybe it's a speed it could maintain for a super long time, or maybe it's a short burst. Hard to say. The other paper that seems to go the other way was written by Miriam Hurt and others, and they tried to make a, quote, general scaling model of maximum speed with body mass, which holds across locomotion models, ecosystem types, and taxonomic groups, end quote. It's a pretty audacious goal. Mm -hmm. <laughs> They're basically saying we want to be able to figure out one body mass equation that tells you exactly how fast an animal went, went, no matter what type of animal it is, how big it is, any of those kinds of factors. It'd be useful. Yes. So they made some assumptions. Firstly, that larger animals have bigger muscles and therefore have more power that they can put down. Second of all, that acceleration takes longer in larger animals than it does in smaller animals. And third, that they could guess at a ratio of fast twitch to slow twitch muscle fibers. And you might be familiar with fast twitch fibers are the ones you use when you're doing something like sprinting. It's an anaerobic exercise, or if you curl a dumbbell or something like that. Whereas slow twitch fibers you use when you're running a marathon or any other type of long-term endurance aerobic exercise. So it makes a pretty big difference in terms of maximum speed, what that ratio is. Cheetahs have a really high ratio of fast twitch to slow twitch, for instance. They also made a lot of other assumptions, but I'm not going to go into all those because some of them are pretty boring. And they summarized their findings in several graphs. So basically what they found was that smaller animals were slower just based on not having enough power and I think also the scale of their body in terms of how quick they could go. And then as animals got larger and larger, they, quote, run out of readily mobilizable energy before being able to reach their theoretically possible maximum, end quote, and speed should be in there. <laughs> <laughs> so basically, even though these large animals have a ton of muscle and they should be able to go really fast, they run out of energy before they can get up to that max speed because it takes so much time for them to accelerate. It's kind of an interesting theory to talk about. And so what they did is they plotted the maximum speed of tons of different types of animals. I think it was over 400 animals and graphed out how fast they went versus their body size. What they found was that really small animals couldn't go that quickly. And for a while, as they got bigger and they got more muscle, they started getting faster and faster. But then after a certain point, it diminished again. So there was that slowing down because they couldn't get all the way up to speed before they get tired. They also broke down their model around a few different groups. They looked at 
land animals. So they had birds, arthropods, like cockroaches and stuff like that, mammals and reptiles, and they all kind of fit the same curve. They also tried some flying animals, birds, also some flying insects like dragonflies and mammals, and then, which would obviously be bats. <laughs> and then they had the aquatic animals too, which also included birds because of penguins. <laughs> <laughs> and, Get everywhere. Yeah, as well as the others I previously mentioned and fish and mollusks. And they all match the same general trend, which is really interesting. Another thing I found really interesting about their analysis is that endotherms are generally a little bit faster than ectotherms, meaning warm-blooded animals are a little faster than cold-blooded animals, except that trend was opposite in the water. And I wonder if that has to do with the efficiency of fish and other animals that are ectotherms having gills, because if you have lungs and you're an endotherm, that's a lot of extra stuff you're carrying around that isn't muscle. Mm -hmm. Whereas if you're a shark and you're just pure muscle and gills, <laughs> it would make you a little more efficient at your weight class. Even though this trend applied really well over the large range of all animals, in other words, going from 0 0.01 kilograms up to 10,000 kilograms, you know, from a tiny shrimp all the way up to a blue whale, it works pretty well. When you break it down into a smaller group, you get much larger error bars. So if you try to compare animals that are 1,000 kilograms with 10,000 kilograms, it's really not as predictive of which will be faster. That's interesting. Yeah, and it makes some of the interpretation by the popular media a little bit wrong because <laughs> they were talking about things like cheetahs. The reason they're faster is because they're smaller, but then tigers are slower. And actually, if you look at the data, a tiger should be faster just based on the general trend. So... Not really a good analysis by some people, but <laughs> it did work pretty well broadly, as I said, and they actually ended up using some dinosaurs in order to try to validate their model. Hmm. So what they did was they plotted on things like Apatosaurus and Brachiosaurus, and they saw that those fit the decreasing trend of speed that would be predicted by their model. And they also listed the predicted speeds that their model does versus speeds that other authors have presented in the past. And just for fun, I'm going to point out the speeds of some of the dinosaurs. So they said that Velociraptor of those that they tested would have been the fastest at 55 kilometers an hour, 34 miles an hour. Allosaurus would have been about 41 kilometers an hour, 25 miles an hour. Tyrannosaurus rex came in at 27 kilometers an hour or 17 miles an hour for a top speed. That's pretty quick. I don't think most people could outrun that. Maybe. I mean, that's like a four-minute mile, a little bit less. It also depends on endurance. Yeah, that's really the big question. Most people could probably do it for a few hundred feet, but after that, <laughs> start to catch up with you. I don't know how long the T-Rex endurance is either. Triceratops, they think, could go 24 kilometers an hour or 15 miles an hour. Apatosaurus was starting to decline pretty rapidly, 17 kilometers an hour, 11 miles an hour. And then Brachiosaurus, which is about twice as big as Apatosaurus, it's all the way down to 12 kilometers an hour or 7 miles an hour. Oh no, those lumbering giants. Yeah, they're not trying to outrun anything really, though, at that point. <laughs> And all of those are kind of their best estimate, but they have really large error bars on them. So you shouldn't take those as absolute numbers. I think T-Rex was more like 10 to 20 miles an hour, but they thought 17 was a good guess. And they didn't mention the ideal weight based on their model. So I went in and calculated it from their fit of their running model on land because I couldn't resist. And <laughs> according to their model, the ideal weight on average, would be about 90 kilograms, or about 200 pounds, which is in the territory of a Deinonychus, or a small tiger. <laughs> <laughs> and that would be, on average, according to their model, about 64 kilometers an hour, or 40 miles an hour of top speed. That's fast. That is really fast. But there's also a really broad peak around the top speed. So really, anything between 40 and 220 kilograms or about 90 and 500 pounds, is a pretty similar top speed. So they're all going at least 60 kilometers an hour, 37 miles an hour, according to the best fit, at least. 
Now, there's lots of other individual factors that aren't accounted for in this model, because like they originally set out to do, they were only using one variable. They only wanted to look at weight of the animal. But when you look at something like a T-Rex versus a sauropod, <laughs> there's obviously a lot more to consider based on how their muscles are arranged, what kind of ratio of their humerus to their femur is. It's a common ratio to look at in terms of sprinting ability, as well as some other factors like that slow twitch to fast twitch fiber, muscle fiber, which can make a really big difference. But overall, this new model is a huge improvement over the power law alone, which they reference several times. And basically that ignores the endurance factor and shows that something like a sauropod would just be crazy fast because hmm. it's so big and has all these muscles. Why wouldn't it just run 100 miles an hour? So, <laughs> so it's a pretty interesting model, and I'm glad they put it together. You think they did a good job covering all the things they wanted to cover? I think so, yeah. One of the articles I read tried to extrapolate this to elephants running faster than T-Rex because elephants weigh less. <laughs> but I think they're really... I don't think that's really what the authors intended at all because there are such big error bars on the T-Rex that it could have been faster or slower mm -hmm. or the same speed. <laughs> Next up, thanks to Ian for sharing this one with us via Patreon. It's not specifically dinosaur related, but there's a new ichthyosaur, which is the first ever found from the Jurassic in India. And it made a lot of news because it was very well preserved and articulated. It was described in a paper by Prasad and others, and they found it in West India near the present Arabian Sea. We don't really talk about that area much, probably because it was marine at the time. So <laughs> the full ichthyosaur as an adult was probably about 5 meters or 16 feet long, pretty big, and it had really large conical teeth which they describe as very robust. Ooh. <laughs> they really remind me a lot of Spinosaurus teeth, too, looking at them. They have that conical with, like, sort of serrations all the way around the outside look to them. Mosasaurs kind of have similar teeth, too. And they talk about the crushing power of its jaw and its teeth. They say that they would have used their teeth to, quote, grasp a prey with a hard exterior, such as an armored fish, crustacean, or thick-shelled ammonite. So, in other words, those are some really gnarly teeth, and you wouldn't want to be in the water near it, or be a young dinosaur in the water near it. <laughs> Plus, you could probably swim pretty fast. <laughs> yeah, that it, they definitely could, for sure. Although, apparently not as fast as the ectothermic ones, maybe sharks of the time. Hmm. <laughs> Next... Brendan Boddy, who is an animator, created a clip that shows how Archaeopteryx may have moved based on a fossil cast of an Archaeopteryx that Professor Darcy Thompson found 150 years ago. So that's pretty cool, able to work on something that was found so long ago. The clip's about 30 seconds long, and Brendan said he hopes to help experts, quote, develop fully functioning animations of newly discovered dinosaurs, end quote. And his work's currently on display at the Lamb Gallery of Dundee University's Tower Building in Scotland from now until December 15th. And the exhibit is free. So if you're in the area, you should check it out. Can't beat free. Indeed. And continuing the Archaeopteryx train, the High Desert Museum in Bend, Oregon has a new exhibit called Dinosaurs Take Flight, the Art of Archaeopteryx. And it has more than 50 pieces of original art, as well as murals, sculptures, interactive displays, and fossils of Archaeopteryx collected from the Solnhofen limestone in Germany. The exhibit's going to run through April 4th of next year, and it costs $5. So not quite as good as free, but I think there's something if you're a member, it might be free. Next, Scott Persons from the University of Alberta is working with Lida Xing from China University of Geosciences to, quote, explore old and contemporary folklore to uncover possible sites where dinosaur footprints might be found. Nice. Well, yeah, according to CBC. This is really cool. So in a lot of places, dinosaur tracks, like ones made from large carnivores, were thought to be phoenix tracks, and there were shrines built nearby. Hmm. And there's also a lot of folklore in China about dinosaur footprints. So these stories have clues to forgotten track sites, which paleontologists could use to help find and identify them. And Scott said, quote, what I really, really love about that example is that it's a case where ancient people got it right. 
they looked at the anatomy and they made the right connection. We understand today that birds are dinosaurs. It just took modern day paleontology several centuries to catch up. End quote. Just like that giant emu Mm -hmm. in Australia. That's the first thing I always think of now. (laughs) Some reason the vision of the giant emu just like is cemented in my brain permanently. It's a pretty good one. Yeah. I need a good pseudo paleo art version of that. (laughs) (laughs) Next, thanks to Tim who shared this one with us via Facebook. BBC's In Our Time radio show did an episode on feathered dinosaurs, which is available for download. In the episode, Melvin Bragg and his guests, which include Mike Benton from the University of Bristol, Steve Brousset from the University of Edinburgh, and Maria McNamara from University College Cork, talk about theories about feathered dinosaurs, as well as fossils with evidence of feathers and why dinosaurs may have had feathers. If you want to listen, the episode's 43 minutes long, and we'll post a link so you can download it. Next, we got some news about Gertie. Uh, Windsor McKay's Gertie the Dinosaur short is being restored. So Marco Dubois, the artistic director, programmer, and curator at Quebec's Cinématique Québécois, presented the project at this year's Lumiere Film Festival in Lyon, France. And a version of Gertie came out in late 1914, but apparently there's also a 1913 version with additional scenes in front of a live audience. It was part of McKay's vaudeville act where he interacted with Gertie. They found the missing scenes and are working on putting the original back together, and they're commissioning artists to duplicate lost drawings, and there's going to be a new film score. So that'll be cool. Yeah. Gertie is pretty awesome. Mm Mm-hmm. One of the great sauropods. (laughs) (laughs) In animation history, at least. Yeah. (laughs) Next, thanks to Cameron, who shared this one with us via Facebook. In Kansas City, Missouri, there was a huge storm recently that knocked over the giant T-Rex that stood in front of Worlds of Fun Amusement Park. So the park closed early. And Cameron said it was a rough storm, but hopefully they'll be able to get the T-Rex back up soon. And apparently a lot of people took selfies in front of the fallen T-Rex. It's a pretty good opportunity for a selfie. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you could do some some cool stuff. Hopefully it didn't get too damaged when it fell over. It didn't look too bad in the pictures, but I don't know really what it looked like before either. (laughs) But speaking of restoring dinosaurs, the Bayville dinosaur in New Jersey, Dino, is getting a makeover soon. So he'll be getting a new head, yay, and a new look. And that's thanks to the backing of thousands of people from the community. So Dino's been in front of Heritage Square Professional Center for more than 80 years and is currently covered in shrink wrap and is missing his head. He's been in Bayville since 1935, and he was purchased by William Farrow to be an ad for his taxidermy business. <laughs> and William bought him for $5, which I guess was a lot in 1935. Was it? Yeah. That still seems cheap for a whole dinosaur. Well, what's really cool is originally Dino was built for the 1925 silent film The Lost World. Hmm. Okay. So he was basically buying a Mm pre-made piece of memorabilia. That Mm -hmm. is really cool. And he's had a lot of changes over the years. I think we've talked about him before. One time he had spikes, another time he had green eyes and a red mouth. Uh, And he's not in great shape now because he's been hit by a number of trucks. (laughs) Oh, yeah. Yeah. It'd be interesting to see what he looks like with his new design. Yeah. Also, I wonder which dinosaur he was in that film now that we've seen it. I think it was a sauropod, wasn't it? If I remember right. Yeah, he's a, he's a sauropod, but I don't know if I could pick out specifically which sauropod in the film. Oh, true. I wonder if it was in the film. Like, why would they need a life-size version like that? I'm trying to imagine, because it was mostly stop-motion stuff. Mm-hmm. But maybe there Unless were a couple the scenes. Background. Yeah, or like they interacted with one once or climbed on top of it or something. Yeah. I don't remember. It's a pretty good movie, though. Something to look out for if you watch that movie, I guess. Yeah. And you can watch it for free. Mm -hmm. And it's in the public domain. Yep. (laughs) I think you can watch it literally on Wikipedia. Yes. (laughs) It's kind of weird to go to Wikipedia to watch a movie, but... (laughs) But hey, the times we live in. You can also watch Gertie on Wikipedia. Mm -hmm. These aren't the most recently restored versions, though. Oh, okay. But I think they're pretty good. Yeah. 
Next, America's Thanksgiving Parade in Detroit, Michigan is creating its largest float yet this year. It's going to be a 125-foot-long, 20-foot-tall dinosaurs on parade float, which sounds pretty cool. It's going to be part of the parade on November 23rd, and it's got some cute, really cartoony-looking dinosaurs that are wearing Christmas gear. I guess that makes sense. Thanksgiving is always coupled with Christmas for some reason. (laughs) (laughs) It's intruding on your favorite holiday. (laughs) Yeah, but um, there's a sauropod with a Santa hat, two purple triceratops, an orange stegosaurus that's decorating a tree. And there's also other prehistoric creatures, including a mammoth. There's a baby mammoth that swings on its mother's tusks. That's pretty cute. There's a saber-toothed tiger, and there's a dragon. So I'm not totally sure why it's called Dinosaurs on Parade, but I guess it's mostly dinosaurs. Because <laughs> dinosaurs are just synonyms with anything extinct now. Yeah. <laughs> it does look fun and cheery, and it's meant for kids. Apparently it took 40 artists, hundreds of volunteers, and a thousand hours to build. Oof. Yeah. I guess I could see that with all the individual species that they put on there. Yeah, and some of them are moving. Oh, cool. Well, like the mammoth swinging. Hmm. Next, Nottingham Post shared a first look of the new dinosaur-themed adventure golf course, which opened in late October. It's called Last World Adventure Golf in Riverside Family Golf Center, Lenton Lane, and it cost 500,000 pounds to build. The course is inspired from famous golf courses around the world, plus it has dinosaurs. So in the photos, there's a velociraptor skeleton and a triceratops replica. There's also a smoking eight-foot-tall volcano and hatching dinosaur eggs. And they say it takes about an hour to play through. Tickets cost eight pounds for adults and 21 pounds for family tickets. They always link volcanoes with dinosaurs for some reason. I mean, I guess there was a fair amount of volcanism going on, but there should really be a big asteroid or something. That's harder to build. I don't know. You could have like a giant lumpy thing or like a crater or something, especially with a peak ring. That could be kind of tricky to try to golf over. It's like two concentric rings. Uh, Well, I don't think you're golfing. I think the volcano in this case is just decorative. Oh, okay. Well, then it's even better to have a big asteroid like right about to impact (laughs) or maybe it just impacted and there's stuff like. I I think it'd be hard to do right about to impact because where do you hang it on an outdoor golf course? Yeah, that's true. And then what I'm thinking is the volcano is nice and tall. That would get your attention if you're driving by. Yeah, I suppose. But you could make a really tall asteroid impact, too, that could look really cool. I guess. I'm just saying, it's always a volcano in these dinosaur golf courses. (laughs) It's time for an asteroid. (laughs) And speaking of things going extinct, the (laughs) Microsoft just announced that they're not going to make the Kinect anymore. And the reason I bring that up is it's been used for many paleontology projects. We've seen it in museums for moving like dinosaurs or flying like a pterosaur. Aww. And I think there was even one where you danced like a dinosaur. I think that uses used the Connect too. And we've even seen it in research applications for quickly scanning bones and photogrammetry uses. So it's a little bit sad, but they did sell over 35 million units. That's a lot. It is a lot. I think part of that is because it came bundled with the 360 for a while. And there's speculation that there's a replacement in the works because apparently the hardware in the Kinect is getting pretty outdated compared to other devices. And someone even mentioned that the iPhone X has some of these features built into it in that tiny package. So who knows, maybe in a couple years we'll be seeing like get some old iPhone Xs and you can do photogrammetry or something. (laughs) That'd be pretty cool. Yeah. There's a... A video of a 17-month-old girl in Taiwan, and it's of her encountering a sauropod balloon. And so in the video, her dad walks her over to the balloon, but she's scared of it, so she starts walking away. And then her dad follows her with the balloon and attaches it to her back. And then she starts trying to run away from the dinosaur. She's getting really upset, and she asks her mom for a hug. And then the dad removes the balloon while he's laughing, because it is pretty cute. And then picks her up and tells her, let Papa come and save you. (laughs) So the video went viral in Taiwan. Apparently the parents had bought the balloon for their son, but then they wanted to film their daughter's reaction when they saw that she was scared. (laughs) But don't worry, her mom said, quote, she was fine and slept very well that night. 
Yeah, I was thinking like that poor girl's going to be traumatized by balloons or yeah. dinosaurs or something because she looked really panicked she with did. it chasing her. Although it wasn't really chasing her, no, but she thought it was. It was cute. <laughs> I'm glad she wasn't scared for too long. Yeah. <laughs> then I can enjoy the video. <laughs> Next, uh, Primark in the UK is now selling a bunch of onesies. Speaking of dinosaurs and babies, toddlers, <laughs> <laughs> including a bright blue dinosaur one that's going to cost about 10 to 11 pounds. So the, the good thing about onesies is that boys and girls can wear them, though they do appear to be kid sizes only, Garrett. I don't wear onesies. I wear footy pajamas. Oh, sorry. That's... Nobody ever knows the difference. I don't know. It's just insulting. It's the same thing. It's just, <laughs> is that just what you call it for adults? It's not the same thing. Onesies snap in the crotch oh. for easy diaper access. <laughs> Footy pajamas are like a full jumpsuit. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Got it. I'll try to remember. Good. <laughs> <laughs> Next, there is one couple in the UK who had a dinosaur at their wedding, so they asked the best man's little brother to wear one of those inflatable T-Rex costumes and then chase them into the reception while the theme song of Jurassic Park played, which sounds pretty cool. Yeah. We could have done that. We could we thought of it. Well, we had a full dude in a T-Rex suit. That's true. That was good, too. Not one of those inflatable ones. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> true. <laughs> And last, National Geographic Kids has a quiz called Which Dinosaur Are You? But adults can totally take it too. It's a personality quiz, and it asks about the kind of snacks that you like, your hobbies, your favorite colors, animals you like, mythical creatures that you like. I chose a dragon because that seemed like an obvious connection. But there's also uh, how your friends would describe you, your ideal vacation spot, a superpower that you'd want. I chose super speed because there was no invisibility or flight, which was a bummer. <laughs> and I ended up somehow with Triceratops. <laughs> I wonder if sauropods were in the running. I don't know. I only took it once. But the quiz's description is pretty friendly. It said, quote, Hi there, Triceratops. Your easygoing personality helps you keep your cool when things get tough, but you're not afraid to defend yourself or your beliefs. At least you don't have to use three horns on your head for protection like Triceratops did. End quote. Potentially. There goes that herbivore bias again, though. Triceratops might have been super aggressive. We don't know. Yeah, but I like that they squeeze in a fact with this personality quiz. What's the fact? Triceratops had three horns. Oh, true. Yes. <laughs> 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 Just not necessarily using them the way that they say it did. Yeah, well, according to this quiz, they're easygoing. I don't buy it. <laughs> <laughs> And before we get into our dinosaur of the day, we would like to remind you that this episode is brought to you by TRX Dinosaurs, and they make really awesome prehistoric animal restorations that are scientifically accurate, which is really important to us, mm -hmm. and partly why we're so drawn to these models. They're so cool. So on their website, they have the TRX Deinonychus, which is one-to-one -one scale. None of this 1 to 16 to scale <laughs> garbage that you normally see. And that one comes completely covered in black feathers, which are sculpted in a really cool way, including wing-like arms. Oh, yeah, which that's are a really pretty, pretty great. one. And their feet are just amazing looking. I don't know how they do it. It looks so great. They also have a velociraptor at 1 to 1 scale. If Deinonychus is not your thing and you want something slightly smaller. And then this one is, rather than having the more realistic faux feathers on it, this one is fully sculpted. So it looks really cool sitting still because the feathers are actually sculpted right into the foam when they make them. And I think that might even make it a little bit more durable too. It looks really great. And if neither of those dinosaurs are your thing... They really like to do custom orders, and that's actually how most of their work gets done. So right on the front page of their website, you can go in and you can put in your name, email address, and then exactly what species and characteristics you want your prehistoric animal, hopefully dinosaur, to have. 
and they'll sculpt it specifically to your needs, whether you want it to be a puppet or a sculpture, if you need the eyes to blink, how big you want it to be, all of that kind of stuff can be customized. Yes. And this goes for museums, too, if you are looking for something to make your exhibit stand out. Yep. Or if you're just a collector and you want something unique that none of your dinosaur enthusiast friends have. And the sculptures are also posable, so you can display them however you want in your exhibit. Yeah. Or in your house. Mm -hmm. If you're a museum wannabe, (laughs) like we are. (laughs) Slowly collecting dinosaur replica items. (laughs) Yep. (laughs) So if you'd like to check out a couple of his examples or place an order for your own dinosaur, head over to trxdinosaurs.com. And again, it's trx like T-Rex, but without the E, dinosaurs.com. And also check out their Instagram at trxdinosaurs. And now onto our dinosaur of the day, Protoceratops which was a request from Ian via Patreon and Dinosaur4602 via YouTube, so thanks. Protoceratops was a ceratopsian that lived in the Cretaceous in what is now Mongolia, and the name means first horned face. It was described in 1923 by Walter W. Granger and William King Gregory. James Blaine Shackelford, a photographer, first found Protoceratops in the Gobi Desert in 1922 as part of an American expedition led by Roy Chapman Andrews, and they were looking for the ancestors of humans, They didn't end up finding any human fossils, but Andrews collected a lot of Protoceratops fossils, as well as Velociraptor, Oviraptor, and Cetacosaurus. The type species is Protoceratops andrewsi, and as you can guess, the species name is in honor of Roy Chapman Andrews. There's two species, Protoceratops andrewsi and Protoceratops helenicorhinus. Protoceratops helenicorhinus was named in 2001, and it lived around the same time and place as Protoceratops andrusi, but it had a slightly different frill, more robust horns, and it was a lot larger. It also had two small nasal horns and no teeth at the front of its snout. At one point, there was another species, Teresa marianska and Halska osmolska, described another species, Protoceratops Kozlowski in 1975, though the fossils that they described were from an incomplete juvenile and they're now thought to be synonymous with Bagaceratops Rosdesvenskii. At first, Protoceratops was thought to be the, quote, long-sought ancestor of Triceratops, end quote. <laughs> <laughs> it's part of Protoceratopsidae, which are early horned dinosaurs, and it had some primitive traits, and it was smaller than later Ceratopsians. It was about 6 feet or 1.8 meters long. Adults could weigh up to 400 pounds or 180 kilograms, though many protoceratops were about the same size as modern sheep. Big sheep. Yes. (laughs) And actually, protoceratops is known as the sheep of the Cretaceous. That's a new one. (laughs) Because they were so common. (laughs) Yeah, I guess. (laughs) And Anthony J. Martin has called them at one point Mesozoic mutton. (laughs) That's good. (laughs) Yeah, I like that one. Nicholas Longridge said that Protoceratops has often been found in an upright position, so they may have been standing in tunnels when they died, which means that they may have burrowed. And it would also make sense why so many Protoceratops have been found, because being underground meant that they were less likely to be scavenged. That's an interesting thought. Mm -hmm. Roy Chapman Andrews found fossilized eggs in Mongolia in the 1920s that were thought to be Protoceratops, but then that turned out to be Oviraptor. We talked about this in episode 78, Oviraptor, and that's when that's why scientists first thought that Oviraptor ate Protoceratops eggs, and Oviraptor got its name, Egg Thief. In 1971, a Velociraptor finding a Protoceratops was found in Mongolia, and they probably died by a sandstorm or had a sand dune collapse on top of them. Yeah, that's by far one of the coolest dinosaur finds ever. It's called the Fighting Dinosaurs. Yeah, just sad sudden death. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, in 2011, a nest of 15 young Protoceratops andrewsi was found in Mongolia. It was the first Protoceratops nest found. And that shows that Protoceratops may have cared for their young, at least early on. Other Ceratopsians may have also cared for their young, since Protoceratops was a basal member. Their eggs probably incubated for at least 83 days, and this is based on studies of the lines of growth in teeth in embryo Protoceratops andrewsi. 
Protoceratops was the first dinosaur found preserved with footprints. There was one found in 1965, but it wasn't studied until 2011. But the footprint was right under the skeleton. Oh, cool. Yeah. Protoceratops was most likely quadrupedal. It had a large beak for cropping vegetation, and it had pointy cheekbones called epijugals. It had powerful jaw muscles to slice through plants, and it had a large skull. It also had large orbits in the skull, so it probably had large eyes. And it had sclerotic rings in the eyes, so it may have been cathomeral. It had a large neck frill, which was probably used for display, but it could have also been used to protect the neck or anchor the jaw muscles, although in that case the frill was probably too fragile. The frill had two large holes, and the size and shape of the frill was different among individuals. Some had shorter frills, others had frills about half the length of their skulls, and this might be due to age and sexual dimorphism. They may have lived in herds, and there are some people who think that Protoceratops was what inspired the mythical griffin creature. So Adrian Mayer, a folklorist and science historian, suggested that Scythian nomads who mined gold may have found Protoceratops and other dinosaurs with beaks, which may have led to the myth of the griffin, which is, you know, it's lion size, it's got large claws and a beak and it laid eggs. Greek writers first described the griffin around 675 BC when the Greeks first came into contact with Scythian nomads. Interesting. Yeah, but not everybody agrees with this. Because griffin anatomies are of modern animals. you got the lion and the eagle. And then there's a variation of griffin images and maybe written stories, which means that there may have been multiple origins. And the ancient Greek writings don't seem to have too much reference to protoceratops. So, hard to say. Hmm. And I guess depends on who you talk to. Yeah. But it is kind of cool to think about. Protoceratops lived alongside Gallimimus, Velociraptor, Ovaraptor, and Tarbosaurus, and it lived in a dry and arid habitat. And our fun fact of the day is about the origin of Ornithischian quadrupedality, inspired by a paper by Paul Barrett and Susanna Maidment. And they point out that within Ornithischia, Quadrupedality evolved at least three times. So there are ceratopsians, like protoceratops, for example. There's thyreophorans, which include stegosaurs and ankylosaurs, as well as hadrosauriforms, which includes just a myriad of the cows of the Cretaceous, like hadrosaurs. <laughs> <laughs> and they all evolved from these bipedal ornithischians that were around before them in the Triassic or Jurassic. Interestingly, all of those are completely discrete events, so it's the kind of thing that evolved over and over again, it looks like. And that's why they say at least three times, because it may have happened more than once and ended up with animals that looked similar, because a lot of times they end up looking kind of similar. It turns out that when you have to adjust for your forelimbs to become weight-bearing, your hips end up changing in similar ways. And your hind limb musculature also adapts in similar ways. And it just all around ends up with kind of similar looking quadrupedal dinosaurs, even though they all evolved independently. Must have been an advantage to be quadrupedal. I think so for herbivores in some cases, at least. Mm -hmm. Cool. And that wraps up this episode of I Know Dino. Thanks for listening. And don't forget to subscribe so you don't miss out on any new episodes. You can... Also, join our growing community on Patreon at patreon.com slash I Know Dino. Thanks again, and until next time. Thank you for listening to I Know Dino. If you have any questions or comments about dinosaurs, we'd like to hear from you at plesiosaur at iknowdino.com. And for more information on dinosaurs, go to iknowdino.com or follow us on Google, Facebook, Tumblr, or Twitter at iknowdino.